Hey everybody, how's it going? It's Friday, hope you're gonna have an amazing weekend. It's time for SMG viewers comments. Let's get right to it. One day, we'll go back to when musicians actually had some dignity and self-respect to want to be good at their art instead of defending cheap methods like cupping the mic, auto-tune, sample replacement, looping, and cut and paste, quantizing, and all the rest of it. Then again, this is the participation trophy generation where no one tries and everything is a cover, a remake, a reboot, or another fake copy that no one will remember in a few years' time. Wow, I agree with most of that. Um, I will say this, there are uh, an overabundance of covers out there on YouTube and nobody seems to be listening to anything new where rock music's concerned. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, let me know. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of guys doing metal covers and doing really well of doing stuff that wasn't originally metal. And you know what? That's fine and whatnot. But then again, to say nobody's going to remember that, that's not really true. I mean, like there's still some great covers that came out 30 years ago of songs that weren't necessarily metal and I still listen to enjoy, most notably Megadeth doing These Boots Are Made For Walking. Uh, Judas Priest did a Joan Baez song, Diamonds and Rust. No, that was not an original. And they still gotta play it live to this day, so don't shit on covers. But all the rest of the stuff were people taking cheap methods. Yeah, you know what, you're right. It's like, yeah, let's make some art. My, cupping the mic is never, I've never really considered that a cheap method. I've just considered that, you know, it's like maybe it's like you, it makes your mic louder when you're on stage. So you think you need that sound in the studio and it just m winds up making things sound small. <sighs> anyway, the, f the fight continues. Greg Lund, I noticed a lot of newer bands have this sort of really shitty emo screamo sound and it makes me fucking cringe. So I see a lot of unoriginality. Any tips on how we can develop a more original style or sound? Greetings from the Midwest. Yeah, um, turn off auto-tune. That's, that's the first one. I will say this. Yeah, I think there is an overabundance of the screaming thing. I think it's kind of been done and I think it's kind of run its course and nobody's really doing anything new with it. I'm not saying it's easy. Uh, Jared Dines kind of showed that in one of his videos. Yes, you do have to practice hard at it to make it work. Nobody's singing anymore, and that that's kind of weird. I think if bands really want to stand out these days, bring back the singing, and better yet, learn to harmonize with your bandmates, because that will give you your own sound because your voice is your own sound. Everybody's got their own voice. And when you take several unique voices and combine them, you get something really unique. See Queen and Van Halen um, as great examples of that. Bands that took a couple different singers and you know fused them into their own thing. Very cool stuff. You know, other bands have done it as well and there's no reason why you can't do it. You just gotta practice. Good luck, dude. Hey man, love your channel. I learned a lot. I recently started working as a front house engineer, uh, but what always gets me going is I have to ask the bass or guitar player to turn their fucking amps down. They keep turning it back up, not understanding the mix is gonna sound shit. How do I pre approach these things? The nice way really isn't working. Greetings from Holland. Hey Elaine, thank you so much for writing. Now, here's some useful advice. I'm gonna go back uh, to about 93 when I was playing in a band. I used to sing in a group. And I remember this, you know, probably the best sound we ever had was playing at a place called the Studio Lounge. Uh, just outside of Detroit, one of, the, one of the Detroit suburbs. A great, great place. I don't know if it's still there or not. Anyway, point being was when we did the show, I remember, you know, the band before us had their amps set up at the side of the stage facing in. They weren't facing the crowd. And we thought, hey, that's a great idea. We should try that. So we did that. You know, the drums were in the center. And then, you know, guitar amp was one side of the stage. Bass amp was the other side of the stage facing in. It was probably the best sound we've ever had at a show because they had this massive PA system. I think what's going on while the guitar players are constantly turning up is maybe their amps are in the wrong place and they can't hear themselves. Or the, you know, the drummer's complaining because he can't hear anything because maybe his monitor mix isn't right. So maybe you should talk to the bands and say, hey guys, you know what? If you put your amps at the side of the stage and face it, man, and we mic them up, you're gonna be able to play at a comfortable volume that's loud enough, you're gonna be able to hear, the rest of your band's gonna be able to hear and your drummer's gonna be able to hear. And we can mic that and we're gonna get an awesome sound coming out of the PA and you guys are gonna love the results. So try that. In this case, reasoning with them might actually work. Hey Glenn, next time we can throw the amp at the people complaining. Dude, that is a great idea for a video. I think I wanna make that video. What do you guys think? Hey Glenn, which will be better for a long-term joining a band for a 13-year-old guitar or bass? Okay, um, I think in the short term, you should learn how to use commas. But in the long term, I would say learn bass, not guitar. And here's why. Half the reason the show's so successful is because I'm always ranting and raving about bass players being terrible. And that's pretty universal. There's a lot of shit bass players out there and people don't take the instrument seriously enough. The thing is, if you can play bass well, that will give you a career because bands are always going to be looking for great bass players. Not mediocre bass players, but great bass players. If you sit your ass down and you start practicing every single night for the next five years, 
you can master that instrument. And if you master that, you will definitely get work probably for the rest of your life. You look at somebody like Tony Franklin, that guy is playing like everywhere all the time. The guy's just incredible. He plays fretless and he's just like a fucking surgeon with that thing. He's so precise with his intonation and his playing and his dynamics are just incredible. And he's in demand, you know, and he's been in demand for decades. So do that because a great bass player is worth his weight in gold. Good luck, dude. Hey, Glenn, could you make a shirt that says, if God was a musician, he'd be a bassist? See rule number two for more details. That was my carpentry instructor's response after reading my shirt, as well as mentioning that he himself is a bassist. Effin' good music, that was an effin' great suggestion. You know what, I'm gonna make that shirt available this week and this week only. Here you go, if God was a musician, he would probably be a bassist. See rule number two for details. Get it now, it'll only be around till next Friday. This is probably a dumb question, but can this Lewitt mic be hooked up to your laptop? I get that it's not optimal, but the reason I ask is because I do some podcast work from time to time and I don't have a professional recording booth. If not, what are some laptop mics you would recommend? Here's the next model down. This is the Lewitt LCT240 Pro. I mentioned this in the last episode. And this is a great mic. This is this is really cheap at 149 bucks, but you're still going to need an interface to get it into your computer. You know, you can use one of these. This is a Focusrite 2i2, or you can get a Focusrite Solo. You basically need something with a preamp and a USB connection to be able to get it into your computer. Uh, there are USB mics with the with the preamp and converters all built right in. I don't know how good they are. I think Blue makes makes a couple. Rode makes the Podcaster. I really don't know how much you're looking to spend, so I can only uh, guess. I'll put some links in the description below for some suggestions you guys can check out and see what fits your budget. Hey Glenn, what is your opinion on the BBE Sonic Maximizer 362, 482, etc.? I've heard running it through your effects loop of your amp really brightens your sound and has the removing the blanket off your cab effect. Hey Barry, whoever told you that's a fucking idiot. The BBEs are the Sonic Destroyer. They fuck with the phase and just make your guitar sound like ass. They are musicians, toys, nothing more, and nothing to ever be put in a fucking signal chain of, a, of somebody who actually wants to get good sound. Avoid like the plague. They're worse than the fucking cab clone. Just no. So I've been watching viewers comments for a while now and based on the sheer number of times you have suggested the Joy of Zombie, I bought one and I completely love it way more than my Spider 5 I was using to record demos. I'm currently in the middle of re-recording everything and it sounds so much better. Thanks very much for the advice you give, Glenn. Keep it up. Well, hey, dude, if I give a little more advice, use a fucking period in there. Do you know how hard it is to say that shit out loud? Fuck. Punctuation, people. It matters. Anyway, glad the zombie's working out for you. If you don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, check out my Joyo Zombie demo. They're cheap, they're awesome, and yes, they will destroy a Spider 5, especially when it comes to recording metal tone in your home studio. Better to get an amp that makes one good sound instead of 500 shit ones. I've said this a million times, and I'll keep saying it until you guys fucking realize it. Glad, glad, glad! I'm in a band in New York City where there's almost no rock scene at all. We don't believe in fixing it in post. We love to play hard rock and we really need a drummer. It's been literally years since we've had anyone steady and we haven't been able to play out because of it. We don't play basement clubs either. Our last show was a 1500 plus venue when we even had roadies. Roadies, I say. We're at a loss and have no idea what to do. Any good advice would be appreciated. Thanks much and cheers from Hell's Kitchen. Lewis E. Well, dude, I hope you're telling the truth and you're not like that band Threaten, which is just kind of bullshitting their way to fame. If you really do have these kind of gigs and this kind of capability, um, then yes, I'd recommend to a viewer out there, if you're based in the New York area, you play drums and you're looking for a gig, look up Louie and uh, hopefully it works out for you. Hope that helps, dude. Question, I have a band and we are working on a lot of songs right now for a future CD. Problem is that my stepmom is a huge bitch who won't let us practice. I bought my guitar and amp, but my dad owns all the other gear for his band that we used to practice. I'm an 18 year old graduating high school in January and I got a few grand in my name. What should I do? He won't let me take the gear somewhere else. Should I sabotage their marriage? Buy my own gear? Wait it out? Well, instead of ruining your father's marriage, at least respect him. I'm sorry not getting along with your stepmom. The question is, maybe you guys can compromise and find a solution that works. Like, is there a time when she got do, does something not in the house when you guys can practice? That would be my first suggestion. Um, or yeah, take a few bucks and rent a PA system. That might work too. And go find a different rehearsal spot. I mean, you don't necessarily have to go buy a re rehearsal PA. You can probably rent something for quite reasonable. And yeah, last suggestion would be save up your money and go get your own place. That's how it worked out for me because my parents weren't exactly supportive of my whole music thing either. Um, we wound up renting a rehearsal spot and we bought a cheap PA used. You know, there's always that. Take a look at Craigslist. Maybe that'll work for you. 
Perhaps a silly question, but do you think pushing a musician to their breaking point applies if the musician is really well prepared? You've said in the past five takes is your general rule for a musician being prepared. If a musician do it all right in those five takes, do you have them do more to really push them? All for pushing the musician, I just want to see how those two coincide. The answer being, that depends. Sometimes you can push a musician and it'll be great. Sometimes uh, you've only got to do one take and you're pu pushing a musician hard enough. I find a lot of the times the five take rule is wishful thinking as opposed to the reality of the situation. It's like sometimes the musician really needs to be pushed a lot harder. It really depends. You know, a band um, like Twisting Life that came in and did Rock Me Amadeus, they didn't need to be pushed at all. We got great takes on them because they were super prepared. I don't know if I'd pushed them any harder if we would have got anything better out of them. I've had another situation where I did the Betrayer record and the guitar player laid down all the guitar tracks, quad track in about three, four hours and he was just on fire. There was no way in hell I was gonna fuck with that because it was just one of those sessions where everything is just firing on all cylinders. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The real solution here is you have to be flexible. Hey Glenn, I was wondering if you could make a video in regards to bass drum triggers, when to use them, how and why. Instead of making a full-fledged video, I'll just give you the straight story right now. Get rid of them, use drum leveler instead, learn how to record real drums because Triggered kicks are bullshit. Quick question, since you're not a fan of samples, I watched a video of Rick Beato recently in which he talked about the mixing engineer Ali Nee Wallace and him using samples on many old school bands. Tool, Rage Against the Machine, Nirvana, and so on. What do you think about that? I think you should listen to British Steel and learn what a real drum set sounds like. Glenn, do you think you would be more successful if you're working out of a bigger or more happening city than Windsor, Ontario? Or are you hoping one day to be the pioneer of the Windsor Sound? Well, I think the Windsor Sound already exists, and that's my buddy Marty Bach over at SLR Studios here in Windsor. Um, he does this kind of pop thing, and for the most part, it works really well for, for the style of music he's doing, so I'm not going to fucking claim that title anytime soon, nor do I want to. But to answer your question, let's just put it this way. Some things are in the works. I can't say anything yet. I'm not sure if it's going to work out or not, but stay tuned because I might have some very interesting news coming up in regards to what's going on with the show and its location. All right, that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, don't forget to grab the shirt. If God was a musician, he'd probably be a bass player. See so rule number two for details. That's it for this episode. Have a fantastic weekend. I'm out of here! Hey guys, if you like the video, be sure to subscribe as I post every Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. If you want to learn more about recording, check out one of my tutorials or one of my gear reviews if you want the actual honest truth about a piece of equipment. Till next time, stay metal, my friends.